Hello and welcome. I'm guessing you clicked on this video because you want to find out how to become a software developer quickly. If so, I think you've come to the right place. My name is Terry and I've worked for a large number of US major corporations ranging in a wide array of industries as a developer, a manager of developers and a director of software development for over 20 years. So I've seen how software is developed in major corporations from a lot of different perspectives. And I'd like to share some of my insights with you to help you get on track to becoming a software developer. What I want to do in this video is just give you a high level overview of a particular path that you could take to going from knowing nothing about software development to becoming employed and uh, and becoming a, a, a professional developer in hopefully a relatively short time. We might be talking months, we might be talking a year, but relatively short time. Let me say that my primary focus as a software developer has been in as, as a business developer, uh, as opposed to a video game developer or um, I don't know, a, quantitative analyst who would work for a financial company or something or a hedge fund or something like that. Um, so my focus has been in corporate America. And I don't know, I haven't checked this, but my sense would be that that's probably the most abundant place where software developers would be employed, at least in the US would be in just general corporate America. The great thing about that type of development is that um, there are a number of standards that translate very, very, very well from one company to the next. So for example, some companies might be an all Java shop or mostly a Java shop. Some companies may be primarily .NET or whatever. Um, so if you pick a language or platform to uh, focus on first, especially if you follow what I'm going to share with you, there will be plenty of companies that need a lot of that type of uh, expertise. So I will be focusing from the perspective of a Java business developer. That is something that I know very, very well. I know some other platforms to varying degrees, but I know Java the best and I know how to help you to find the most jobs with Java right now. So as I've already mentioned, I guess step one is determining what kind of business you want to be in. And I'm driving you towards those who are interested in becoming business developers as opposed to game developers. I'll probably make another video where I will go into more detail on the pros and cons of different types of developer roles. But suffice it to say, for now, let's just stick with the fact that you're going to be geared towards being a business developer if you're taking my advice in this video today. So you'll be writing software for businesses. You'll need to pick a language to focus on. And as I've already mentioned, I think my primary language has been Java. Java is a great language. If you search the job websites and things, it seems that in all of those rankings that I've seen for the last several years, right up until now, Java tends to rank either number two or number three uh, in the top three for sure. Number one tends to be JavaScript, which is a language that I think you should also learn. I will also say JavaScript and Java are not really related at all. The fact that the word Java is in both is more of a marketing gimmick rather than something that was devised because the languages have some, some technical relationship to each other. They do not. JavaScript is a great language. You do need to learn it for the future. It's probably going to eat the world, but I'm going to focus mostly in this conversation on Java for right now. So let us assume that you're going to focus on Java. Again, I will just say like it's number two or number three out of most rankings of the most popular languages. So you're not, you're not setting yourself up for a dead language anytime soon to spend time to learn Java. So step three, what should you do now that you've decided to learn Java? Well, it's not enough, in my opinion, to only know Java 
and 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 be successful in a career as a business software developer, even in the Java ecosystem. Java by itself, in my opinion, isn't actually all that useful. There are add-on technologies these days that work very well with Java, and I think you generally need to have a, a degree of expertise in uh, at least one or two of those add-on technologies to become a fairly well-rounded and useful and highly employable Java developer. So the most famous technology, I would say, that works with Java is called Spring. So I, I will make another video where I will go into more detail about what Spring is, but basically Spring gives you a framework or scaffolding in which to write your Java code. So Java by itself can be thought of as just this wide open language where you could develop things in kind of any way you want, good or bad. The Spring Framework imposes a little bit of scaffolding on you so that you maybe won't uh, be able to hurt yourself as badly. The developers of the Spring Framework have determined over years good patterns to use for how to do common things that we often have to do, particularly in business programming, like connecting to databases and exposing exposing data via something called REST services or web services and things of this sort. So the Spring Framework has come up with somewhat standardized patterns and helper approaches to doing these typical things that business developers in particular have to do all the time. So that is the uh, some of the benefits of, um, of using a framework like Spring. And Spring, I would say, is, is very much the most popular framework. So you'd want to learn Java, but you'd also need to learn the Spring framework. Um, there is a more specific flavor, if you will, of Spring framework called Spring Boot, which goes even further to uh, reduce the amount of of um, of what what we call boilerplate code that is code that you tend to write in each project so much so that many developers will just copy that code from one project and then paste it into the next. Um, Spring Boot helps to reduce the amount of that copy pasting that needs to be done by just standardizing and hiding all that copy pasted stuff underneath the framework itself. So Spring Boot is a sub project of the overall Spring Framework. I will make another video to go into more detail about, about what Spring and Spring Boot are offering. So, um, so you've learned Java and you've learned Spring or you're learning Spring. The next step in your path should be to endeavor to write some sample projects, some sample applications that utilize what you're learning. You'll want to write applications that are at least small versions of the types of applications that a company would write. And I'll just say really quickly, for the most part, they will be applications that typically run in a web browser. They will give users the ability to typically um, manage and maintain data or records. So let's say, for example, if you are Boeing and you build airplanes, you probably need to track inventory of the parts that go into an airplane. So you might have a website, which we will generally call in this case a web application. It's just a program that runs in the web browser that enables uh, certain key people within the organization to log in and then they can maybe enter inventory as they receive it um, and they can track where that inventory is going and maybe some people might want to know how many of cer a, a certain type of part are used in the 777 airplane, right? So applications that do that kind of thing. So you'd want to try to build at least small scale versions of the types of applications that you may be aware that a company would like to use so that you can prove that you know how to use the general technology. So you'd want to have an application that's in this case written in Java and uses HTML and CSS and some JavaScript because these are all used together in typical modern uh, web applications. And you'd likely need to have your application connecting to some kind of a database. That's a, a, an application where your 
where your data gets stored and retrieved from. So you'd need to make sure that you wrote hopefully a few applications of that kind to, to try out different things. Once you've written those sample applications or as you're writing those sample applications, you'll also want to get to the next step, which is to create your resume if you don't already have one. Um, and what you'll really be wanting to do on that resume is to list out the projects that you've worked on. I'm assuming that if you're watching this video, you have no prior experience as a software developer at all. So you likely won't have any pertinent work experience that you can list on your resume. And you're trying to get your foot in the door though. So what you'll need to do, what will help a lot at least, is to be able to at least list off the personal projects that you've done and to be able to show them. So when you're creating those projects, it will be good if you put them in, in GitHub. And GitHub is a website where you can uh, store your code that you are writing for yourself. Some companies may ask, what kinds of work have you done on your own? And then you can say, oh, well, I wrote this application and I wrote this other application and it uses these technologies. And then they may ask, oh, is there a way that you can share that with us? That's That becomes your portfolio. So if you were a graphic design artist, you might, well, 30 years ago, I don't know exactly how it all works today. You probably have a website, I guess, but maybe 30 years ago, if you were a graphic design artist or something and you went in for an interview, you might take a physical portfolio of samples of your work with you. As a software developer, your portfolio can be the applications that you've developed on your own and put into GitHub. So you could share your GitHub repos. Those are the, that's the name of the the locations in GitHub where your applications are stored. You could share those repos with um, an interviewer or whoever's asking for proof of what kinds of work that you've done. And then they could actually get into your repos and look around and see how you code and what kinds of projects you've used and, and, and perhaps even ask you questions, follow-up questions to make sure that you indeed are the person who actually wrote those applications. So that becomes your portfolio or it can be. And that's a great way. So then after you've updated your resume to list the kinds of work that you've done, whether it's professional or just at home with your own personal projects, you'll want to post your resume on all of the major job finding websites. So I'm talking about websites like indeed.com, Monster, Career Builder, etc. You want to post to as many of those sites as you can, the same resume, you don't need to change it at all. And what'll happen is recruiters who work for recruiting firms or consulting firms, they scour those websites daily. And what they basically do is they just look for keyword matches. So the more technology keywords that you actually know that you list on your resume, the better your chances are of getting contacted by these recruiters for job offers. So for example, a company might be looking for what they'll call a full stack Java developer. That's typically typically going to mean they, they're looking for a Java developer who knows Spring and or Spring Boot, who knows some major JavaScript framework. And uh, I'm not gonna have time to talk a lot about the JavaScript frameworks in this video, but I will follow up in another video. I'll just name what, what the three probably most popular JavaScript frameworks are, which are Vue.js, React, and Angular. Um, and so the more that you can list on your resume of these buzzwords without lying, don't lie, you know, these should be technologies that you've actually used. Um, but the more of the technologies that you actually can list on your resume that you've used, the higher your chances are of getting matched to jobs that exist on the market. Um, and so, like I said, these recruiters will just do basic word searches and match up what the uh, client, which is the company that they are searching for people for, like Boeing, for example, uh, they'll match that up with what's on your resume. 
and the more matches they can find, the more likely you are to get selected, at least to be contacted by the recruiter. And then they'll follow up and ask you questions and things of that sort. And then they, if they think you're a good fit, they will submit your resume. They'll probably touch up your resume and make it look like they wrote it <laughs> um, to some extent. And then they will submit your resume to a prospective client like Boeing or MasterCard or whomever. Um, and, uh, and, then, and, and then someone on that side at the company will look over your resume and decide if they want to try you out for an interview. So that gets us to the next step, the interview process. So in the interview process, I mean, they'll ask you, they'll try to determine, do you actually know what you're talking about, right? Do you have the skills that they need for that job? They may also want to give you a coding challenge. Um, good companies typically will want to give you a coding challenge. In fact, um, what that will often entail will can, can take a few different forms. It could be an offline coding challenge where they will just give you some specification for an application that they would like you to write. And then you will write uh, that. It will usually be something very simple though, but that you'll write that on your own time and then submit it. Sometimes you may be asked to submit it via GitHub, or maybe they'll want you to zip it up and send it to them. I don't know, but um, that's one way. Another way could be that you will come in well, I don't know, in, in during this pandemic, you might not be coming into any office anymore. It, it'll likely be remote. But um, another way that they could do it is that they may present you with a project already created by them and have you perhaps just fill in some blanks or fix it. Maybe it's a little broken in some way and you need to prove that you know enough of the, at least of the basics to be able to get that application up and running. That is an approach that I have done in the past. Another way could be that they may ask you to just create a simple application from scratch right there in front of them. I've done that. I've done. I've used all three of these techniques in the past to varying um, to varying levels of of success. Um, and so you will want to be prepared for the eventuality that they may ask you to take some type of a coding challenge in front of them, very very possibly. And uh, and then if they like you and they they'll tell the recruiter, yeah, we like this candidate, we want to hire them, what will likely happen is um, uh, you'd first start off as a contractor. So you would actually be employed by the recruiting firm. Um, that's who would pay you, but you would be working for the recruiting firm's client, which is the company. Um, again, it could be a Boeing or a MasterCard or whatever. In many cases, if you're really great, after three or six months or 12 months, um, sometimes 18 months, uh, the client, the company, may opt to convert you to a full-time employee, in which case they basically buy out your contract from the uh, recruiter or the contracting firm, and you then become a full-time employee of the client. So at that point, you're a full-time employee of the major company that you've already been working for. That's a very typical path. So um, like I said, this, is, this video is just meant to give you a basic high-level overview of a path towards becoming a software developer. If you're not currently in the field at all and you've been wondering how can I get started, hopefully this gives you a good overview of what a path could look like. There are certainly other paths that I may or may not know better, but this is a very typical path that I am very familiar with and it's one that I know can work for a lot of people. Um, so in subsequent videos, I will go into more detail on many of the steps that I've outlined here, but I'm trying to keep this video from being too long. It's kind of tough. Please, if you like this video um, or if you have any questions, I definitely would like your feedback. So please provide your feedback in the comments below, and that will help to drive what subsequent videos I will make in the future. There's so many topics that I can share um, with my 20 years of experience uh, as a corporate software developer. I've got a lot that I can share and hopefully be of, of, of a lot of help to a lot of people. And, you know, feel free to reach out to me in the comments and uh, let me know what you'd like to see in these videos and I will add it in there where I can. Other than that, take care and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.